Hello, 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 and thank you for checking out The Latrell Show, building businesses, bars, and brands. My name is Jason, and before we get into our episode, I just wanted to reach out to you and say, hey, everything is going to be okay. That doesn't mean it's not going to take a ton of work. That doesn't mean it's going to be tomorrow, but we are going to be okay. And so while we're waiting for bailouts, unemployment, um, I think it's time to start getting motivated to take action because action is what this situation requires. And there's a whole sub economy out there of, of people who make money without leaving their homes and they do it over the internet. So if you notice that the post office isn't closed, FedEx isn't closed, DHL isn't closed, there's a lot of opportunity out there and we have to be proactive about it. So we'll get into that uh, in further episodes, but without any more delay, here is Anthony Caporelli. Welcome to the show, Anthony Caporelli. <laughs> Thanks. Good to be here, Jason. So, uh, so tell me about Imbibel. All right. So the Imbibel is, it started out as an activation for Drambuie when I was the national brand ambassador for Drambuie back in 2014. And we actually premiered a proof of concept of the show at Manhattan Cocktail Classic in um, May of 2014, that we were getting ready to put it into the New York International Fringe Festival, which is a theater festival specifically for experimental and fringe theater. We'd been accepted, and I had been doing a series of lectures at MCC called The Science of Mixology, where I was trying to combine uh, all the information that you and I love to get at these conferences, all the brand information, all the science, all the history, with more theatrical elements, just to kind of stand out for the brand, but also to make it more engaging and to attract a wider audience than just, you know, diehard cocktail heads. So I had had a long background in the theater, as a lot of people in our industry at least used to, uh, but I think I think still do. And so sure. I was running a theater company and I uh, was bringing some folks in to these uh, to these lectures to do little comedy bits and sketches and uh, demonstrations of, you know, live distillation and things like that. And it went really, really well. And so I decided, you know, let me see if we can do this as an actual staged presentation for a general audience, not a cocktail industry audience, a spirits industry audience. We're in New York and I figured, you know, maybe someone downtown will want to come. Um, I was also teaching and still am at the Institute of Culinary Education. So I took mm -hmm. a bunch of information from those classes. A lot of the stuff that we talk about when we're touring conferences like Tales and, you know, the former MCC, whatever that ends up being again. RIP. <laughs> RIP. Is that ever going to happen again? I, I don't, don't know. They don't keep know. trying and we got the Brooklyn thing now. Anyway. So, we, we miss you, Leslie. We miss you. Oh, my God. Tell me about <laughs> it. Um, so they were lucky. You know, we were lucky enough to be able to have a, a spot there went over really well as sort of a proof of concept. It was almost like a glorified stage reading of what we wanted to do. And then we opened at Fringe in, I believe, September 2014. And the whole central conceit of the show is it's the history of cocktails and spirits starting in 10,000 BC from when we sort of discovered fermentation and what happens when you leave sugar solutions out, you know, mashed grain or grape juice or honey, whatever it is, mm -hmm. right up to today's cocktail movement. And it's, again, it's a lot of the stuff that I would cover in my professional classes at the Institute of Culinary Education, also for my clients when I do restaurant consulting. But I could, I don't even want to say sugar-coated. I think I, what I wanted to do was just make it more, more fun for people that weren't actively seeking this information. And so I put a, I was singing with a barbershop group at the time. So I put a bunch of cool barbershop uh, acapella songs in there. I rewrote a lot of lyrics, sweet and lovely mm -hmm. became sweet and bitter, which is, you know, the old fashioned <laughs> uh, recipe. Um, and so we did a lot of stuff like that. And then lots of costumes, comedy, but at the end of it, people still say it feels more like a musical Ted talk, um, you know, about cocktails and spirits. Turns out, after five performances at Fringe, we made the cover of the arts section of the New York Times, we sold out every show, and we were asked to extend for an encore series off-Broadway afterwards, uh, which also sold out. And at that point, I said, you know what, let me see if I can just run this thing on my own. So we started out two nights a week. Tickets were $18. We were playing downtown Literally, I'm guessing a, no. I'm guessing no drinks included in no, that. No, believe it or not, Jason, our whole thing was we've had three drinks included with the show from day one. So Whoa. as we teach you about the drinks, you're actually drinking them. So we tell you the whole story of how beer was discovered, and we're serving you a shandy. 
as we're doing that. And then we tell you about why an old fashioned works and we serve you an old fashioned right in the middle of the show as we're singing. Uh, we tell you the whole story of the origin of the gin and tonic, the East India Company, all of that. And with, then we make gin and tonics live in front of the whole audience and serve them, which again, you know, I learned how to do you learned how to do because you don't do a cocktail lecture without serving 200 drinks to the attendees, right? <laughs> but it was new for theater. It was especially new for traditional off-Broadway theater. Uh, you know, when I first started in the theater, you couldn't even bring drinks into the into the house, mm-hmm. let alone serve them during the show. So this was sort of what it was sort of new, but believe it or not, you know, it's, I guess it's not hard to believe it. Audiences loved it. So for 18 bucks, you were getting a musical and three drinks in New York and it was it was insane. Well, and if you, I mean, if you go try to buy a drink in, in a theater now, that drink, that one drink is $18. At, at a minimum, right? So, at a minimum. Yeah. So anyway, it, the show did did well, and we were able to uh, eventually up the ticket prices um, and move into a, a bigger venue in Midtown, New World Stages, which is the premier off-Broadway venue. Uh, it's where Jersey Boys is running, Rock of Ages is running, you know, all the big Broadway shows come there. And so they actually gave us their cabaret lounge as the resident company. And we've been there for over three years now as the resident company in New World Stages. And having done that now, we were able to expand the show to three other versions. So the first version is just an overview of Cocktails and Spirits, you know, about 12,000 years worth of history. And again, we do distillation live on stage every night. Um, We do fermentation live on stage. Kind of give people a tactile experience for these things. So, yeah. so you were talking about how you can uh, condense distillation, and you know you have three separate shows. You're con- condensing distillation in so, twelve thousand years of history. And, yeah. yeah. So the first show was that. The second show that we did was actually uh, we were asked to do a show on one of the, the uh, harbor cruises in New York on a boat. So we figured we would do a show about the history of rum, told by singing pirates. So that and they're all <laughs> called the the whole series is called the Imbible, which is imbibe plus Bible, like mashed together, right? So the second show is Rum and Pirates, which we've been running almost every summer since then. And it's literally a bunch of pirates singing great sea shanties, shanties, telling you the history of rum. But also the idea there is that it's pirate onboarding training. So they teach you how to join a pirate ship. Like, like historic, onboarding? Yeah, onboarding. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and so it's, okay. <laughs> uh, right? So the idea there is they literally like we rig up sails and we teach you how to like hoist sails. We teach you how to sing the work songs. And then we teach you the whole history of rum, the daiquiri, Bacardi, you know, all that stuff and serve you three rum drinks throughout the show that sort of typify the evolution of rum and rum drinks. And that one's just like people come dressed up as pirates. It's, it's like super fun. Yeah. And then we did Christmas show, which is called Christmas Carol Cocktails. And that's a retelling of a Christmas carol where Scrooge, it's a sequel. Scrooge wakes up the next day and decides he wants to throw a party because he loves Christmas now, but he has no idea how to make drinks because he's been Scrooge his whole life. So he calls all the spirits back and they teach him the history of Christmas drinks, past, present, and future. And so we go into the history of eggnog and flips and, and all that good stuff. And we end with using liquid nitrogen to do frozen, we call it Friesling and Fred. So frozen Riesling and frozen red wine, again, live on stage with liquid nitrogen and all kinds of stuff. And then we serve that to the audience and, and they love it. And then the newest show is Day Drinking, which is the history of brunch and brunch drinks. We go into Buena Vista and the history of the Irish coffee. We do sparkling wine and Bloody Mary and all those origin stories. And again, as we, uh, you know, that opens with a build your own Bloody Mary bar where we literally like freak people out and give them like cheese to put in the Bloody Mary. And then we explain through a song called Umami why that works, why you can actually use (laughs) garnishes that are savory in a drink with tomato juice. And there's this great acapella original song. We have That's all original music. We have a great composer. And so we have songs like Umami and Bubbles that explain secondary fermentation and why that's all enhances flavor and riddling and the history of, you know, Vuclico and all that stuff. So it's really, really fun. It's, I think people get it. I like to say it's like Sesame Street for adults with drinks. It's very sort of sketch. Everything kind of ties together, but it's all sort of compartmentalized into scenes that each tell a story. Lots of costumes, lots of jokes. And with every ticket, you get three, what we like to think are, you know, pretty good, pretty good drinks um, that I come up with. And, uh, you know, like even the gin and tonic, people come in and they say, I don't drink gin and tonics. I don't like gin and tonics. Can I get something else? And I say, just try it. 
because they're used to having a gin and tonic at like a rock concert or a club, you know, which is, you know, 50, 50 and a little sliver of lime that's been sitting in the tray for two weeks. And we give them an actual proportioned iced, you know, we don't use any crazy ingredients, but you know, a nice wedge of fresh lime that we cut right before the show and people drink it. And they're like, I'm going to go out and have another gin and tonic after this. What do you, right. what did you do? And I'm like, you know, we use new Amsterdam and Seagram's, but we do it with, you know, with, care and respect and, you know, thoughtfulness for the drink. So, you know, we kind of engage people that way. And and I like it because it gives me an opportunity to talk to the general consumer, which is, you know, going back to 2005, when I started my Art of the Drink video podcast, that was my audience. It was, you know, literally people that would come up to me at the bar and feel like, oh my God, you know, I want to feel cool, but I don't know what any of this stuff is, you know? And I used to say back then that, you know, as a bartender, I used to ask people, I was like, did you ever feel like, Somebody somewhere gave a class about how you're supposed to act in a bar, but you weren't invited. And and my guests' eyes would light up. They'd be like, oh, yeah, I totally get that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I started Art of the Drink, was to demystify this stuff. And the imbible, years later, allows me to sort of continue that. So I know that was a lot of talking, but that's no, no, this is, this is, it gives great context. And and like what keeps going through my mind is just kind of how much uh, information that we as a trade kind of get, take for granted. Uh, We have like all these training opportunities that we don't really take. And you're providing this, this training in a wonderful and thoughtful context. And when you're talking about how it's all put to music, uh, this is very thoughtful music. I, I have a background in music and it's like, this is the same quality of a musical experience that you would get in any major Broadway production. Uh, and it's, I think it's astonishing. I had a chance to check out a couple of videos and, you know, the level is extremely high and, uh, and, and the way it's put together is, is very, very intelligent. So are you also doing things for Drambui? Like, uh, are you, so how, what's your involvement in ICE? Yeah. So Drambui, I was lucky enough to work with Drambui for, <laughs> I always want to say it's like seven years, but it's probably closer to like four or five. It just, it was a tremendous experience back when they were a Bacardi brand. Uh, then they were sold uh, to Brown Foreman and uh, reworked their team in their package. Um, and right at that time, the Imbibel was sort of getting its own legs. So I transitioned over to doing the Imbibel as sort of my full-time industry work. And luckily that's uh, worked out very well. Still a huge fan of Drambu. I probably drink it way more than the average consumer. And I still, you know, that's one of my go-to spirits. But I don't I don't have a formal relationship with them. But I do work with the Institute of Culinary Education. That's that's another thing that I've been doing for about seven or eight years now. I'm the director of spirits education there. Um, and that has been just that partnership has been something that I'm grateful for every day because it gives me a, a, an ongoing relationship with literally the top ranked culinary school in the country as not only an, an instructor, but the director of a program. So I really get to kind of shape, um, you know, how we teach and what we teach and uh, a little bit of the theory of, you know, when you come to ICE, um, you know, how are cocktails and spirits presented? And that that allows me to also work directly with the industry because we have a tremendous recreational program, which is, you know, I just... Uh, I teach things like molecular mixology, uh, culinary cocktails, whiskey, bourbon, and scotch tasting, things like that. But then we also have a professional, that's really the core of the school is it's a professional culinary school. So I teach culinary management, which is an actual diploma program in restaurant management, which, you know, as a former owner operator, (laughs) I love that because we need that. Um, Totally. And it's really important for chefs to understand that as well. Cause I mean, Oh yeah. yeah, Cause they're going to be moving on and matriculating and starting to run their own shops and stuff like that. And they need to know how to cost out a cocktail. Uh, It seems like it's not, I I mean, it's a, it's a revenue driver. It's a major revenue driver, especially when you can have one person that can sell five, $6,000 in a night, versus a team of people that it requires in back of house. Uh, so they got to know how much that stuff costs because it could, you know, be the difference between a success and a failure. Yeah. Um, and as you know, you know, people always say you make all your money at the bar. And I always tell them if you're doing everything right, which not a lot of people are doing, more likely you can lose all your money at the bar because of exactly what you just said, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, absolutely. I think it's really critical for people to be trained in beverage management and not just become the beverage manager because, you know, the last one didn't show up that day or got promoted to something else. Mm -hmm. It's like how we used to become bartenders. The bartender didn't show up. You were the best server on the floor. They put you behind the bar. 
So right? I got my gig, my yeah, first gig. Same thing, same thing. Yep. And, you know, um, so I, I think it's it's useful to be able to have more formal training, both for the employee, but also for the industry. So I'm, I'm really lucky to be involved with ICE in that capacity. And they're always looking to advance beverage management training. We just launched a, the first um, beverage management program. Eamon Rocky is our director of beverage studies. Rocky's Milk Punch, you know, you know Eamon. No, I, yeah, no, I've just, I've just worked with him giving a couple of seminars at, uh, yeah, at, the, at the beverage studies program. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and so he put together this phenomenal program um, and there's a spirits track, a management track and a wine track. And if you actually want to pursue beverage management as a career, you can now come to ICE and take these programs that are, you know, three days a week for six to eight weeks and come out with uh, an actual piece of paper that says, I have training from an accredited culinary school in wine program management, beverage cocktails and program management, or just general management. And so we're really hoping the industry picks up on that and starts using it as a hiring criteria or as a way to implement training that they wouldn't otherwise be able to implement in-house from a time standpoint, from space standpoint. You know, yeah. again, as a former operator, you know, if I could spend all day training people, I would because I love it. You don't make any money and you got to close <laughs> to have yeah. the facility or rent something, right? So if you can just send people to training at ICE the way that every industry in the in the world outside the restaurant industry sends people for training off site and come back with something that's valuable, you know, we think that that's a real contribution to the industry. So I'm I'm very excited about that. And I think, again, compliments to Eamon and the rest of the team there. Yeah, if you're not if you're not constantly reinforcing and contributing to it, a culture of education in your bar or restaurant, regardless of the size of it, you're planning to fail. I mean, like you like if you don't know how to sell the products that you have, if you're not building leaders, then you're 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 just not planning for the future. Like in any in any case, absolutely. I think it was who was it from Bobby. Uh, he was he said this thing one time that really resonated. He was just like talking about building the next like entrepreneurs and and building in like internal leadership. I mean, this is the this is the class I was going to give in, in in Vegas about um, cultivating agency. But you know, like I feel like if you're not building up your team to be able to run your business for you and empowering them to run their own shops, then there's no way that you can you know, leave them to your bar to run it for you. You're, you're anchoring yourself. I mean, you know, I always tell people that the, the best managers are the motivational managers, the mentors, the, the developmental managers, you know, um, for a lot of reasons. But to me, one of the most important is because it frees you up to do other things. It's also, to my mind, the best way to get employee retention. It lowers, you know, shrinkage, theft, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. You know, you, you have to give people a reason to come to work, want to want to be there. And it's got to be more than just a paycheck. It's got to be, you know, training. It's got to be that next promotion. It's got to be developmental. Right. And I think in the, in the restaurant industry, especially we have a tendency to, to lose sight of that. And honestly, you know, Jason, it's one of the things that I think is a little frustrating about when, when the craft cocktail movement got to be it's most precious and it became more about the drink than about the guest. I felt like that was really kind of playing on sort of the worst aspects that we have because our rest, our industry needs to be inherently outward looking. And when it turns inward, it really is almost self-defeating in, in the most basic sense. You know, restaurants are about getting together and being um, socializing and being in a group. And when you make it about yourself, whether it's because it's, you know, uh, you want your recipe published in a magazine or, you know, whatever, you know, it, it's it defeats the point of service, which is inherently, you know, two people interacting. And you know, I always tell my, 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 my bartender, I say, you, know, you got to remember recipes are made for menus, not resumes. I'm, I'm not interested in a, res in a recipe that looks mm. good on a resume. It's got to work on the menu, you know? So I, I totally agree with you, man. Well, and, you know, to your point earlier about, you know, the kind of active, actively hostile relationship, like to the actively hostile relationship between the city of New York and its restaurant operators here, there's also a whole other side of that where there's these kind of opportunistic software as a service companies that are coming in and taking what would be your entire margin in 20 to 30% to market your business and then take your product out of the bar and bring it to somebody else. Like this is already happening in China. I just had a conversation with Chris Lauder and he was telling me that um, there are like these influencers that that would that will 
you know, do a video at a bar and then you can order that drink from that bar and, and take it out. And so like if our product is being sold on the floor at the bar in a social situation uh, and that is the source of your revenue, if that is potentially taken out of the out of the bar, then where is your revenue? And, and so we have to be mindful of that in, in how we behave and how we talk to guests and like that a good product is not good enough. I do. I totally agree with you. And I, you know, again, it's one of the things that I lead most of my classes with. And I always tell people, if you're sitting at my bar, it's not because I make a good drink. You can, you could always go home and crack a beer at the very least today. You can go on YouTube and do anything I can do. You can watch me do it on YouTube, right? The reason you're in the bar is because you want social interaction. And if it's not with the people around you, sometimes it's just with the bartender, you're, you know, alone on business or whatever. I do it all the time. So the day that we abdicate that to me, just lock the doors because that is the value that we add. But I think your point hits something. And another issue that I, that I see all the time is that operators don't appreciate or understand marketing well enough. And I think it's because, you know, we, we get a lot of these, but, you know, you and I, before we actually started recording, talked briefly about, you know, everyone wants to be a bartender, right? Or everyone wants to be a bar owner, right? And it's not all it's cracked up to be. But the reality of it is a lot of bars are opened by former bartenders that, you know, don't know a lot about business and don't know how to, you know, do marketing or but they make a great drink or they have a good following or, you know, they or come great, in like the great crafts people. Exactly. Or they're and, and influencers, that goes, you know, and, yeah. and God love them. I love, you know, <laughs> we can talk forever about influencers, right? right but influencers right, right. are, to me, influencers don't run businesses. Influencers, you know, are, uh, they keep the plate spinning, maybe if you do everything mm-hmm. right. Um, and and I always have to wonder, it's a chicken and egg thing to me. To me, these influencers, it's like, you know, we used to have the water cooler that you talked around. You know, the, mm-hmm. you, you went back in the day when I was, you know, working as an engineer a hundred years ago, you know, it was like, you'd go to a movie and then everyone would be talking about that movie around the water cooler or, you know, the finale to a TV show. And I think today the influencer is really just the water cooler, but we've, we've forgotten that you can't seed a conversation at a water cooler to make a movie a hit. You got to have the movie being a hit and then the conversation happens. Right. But I think we look at social media and influences and things as if we can flip that around. And if we can get the conversation going, we'll turn the thing into a hit. And, I don't know, maybe there's something to that, but I still think that human nature is such that it goes the other way, you know, and you can't take the the result of being successful and try and turn that into the cause of being successful, right? Yeah. And and just because you're successful, one thing doesn't mean that you're successful at other elements too. Like it does not take just a product to be a good bar, a good, uh, you know, good ice does not a good bar make. Um, so if you're excellent at this one area, then you should definitely outsource HR, for instance. You like bet. you should, you should you outsource. Have to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like literally, we're talking about in New York City. If you're not outsourcing HR, I, you know, we got to have a conversation because you know the regulations are crazy. And so, to your mm-hmm. point, I think one of the reasons why we're seeing marketing being taken away from restaurants is because you know nature abhors a vacuum. The restaurant owners aren't doing it, and so where there's an opportunity people will find a way to exploit that opportunity. And I think bars with robust marketing programs, with good followings, with with plans, you know, are going to be less likely to be susceptible to that. Yeah. And it takes a lot of work. And so, you know, you're talking about like, you know, developing systems and processes to, to run the day-to-day operation of your business as much as you can leverage automation as possible so that you can free up your time to do the things that are, that are actually monetizable and important, like getting butts and seats, getting people aware of what it is that you're doing. And that's what you should be spending your time on, not updating yourself on the on whatever HR law changed that day right. or whatever, compli- whatever the compliance issue du jour is from the city. If you're not spending your time just making your product aware, like known in the community and showing them and engaging with like what used to be competition, like you need to have, you need to be part of an ecosystem. I mean, that's what you should be spending your time doing rather than, you know, just dumb shit that doesn't really matter. That doesn't put cash in the register and doesn't put butts in seats. Yeah. It's, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. It is. And unfortunately, a lot of people aren't aware of it, especially aspiring small business owners. You know, they don't realize that the amount of time that you have to spend in business that is not related to your core business, your core deliverable 
is massive and growing every day. Um, there's only so small that you can be right now. Like you said, you know, you need an HR consultant. There's just no way around that, especially in New York City. You need somebody doing payroll for you. You need somebody doing your books for you. You need somebody doing marketing. So, you know, this is why I always tell people, if you love to cook, don't tell me that's why you want to open a restaurant. Go have a dinner right. party. You got to tell me, I like looking at spreadsheets till four in the morning. And then I go, well, maybe we can talk about, because what you, the amount of, I mean, <laughs> you can, you know better than anybody, the amount of time that you get to do, you know, making drinks, which may have drawn you to this industry, once you're actually in the owner position, vanishes really quick. Yeah. I, one thing that I've, that's always puzzled me is this kind of mysterious external locus of control, where if you run your own bar, you are not in control over your own time anymore. And I just don't think that that's really healthy one. And I don't think it's very productive, you know, running your own bar, like in the phase of opening and like phase one, phase two, we're just getting the doors open. Yes, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of time, but there should be a point where you take time off and a lot of people suffer not being able to do that. And that really impacts negatively. That really impacts their business negatively because they're not able to focus on what is really important and they're just burned out and they're tired. And they should be hiring people to do things like pay, run the payroll and man, make sure everybody's showing up on time and make sure that the standards are being met. Uh, I just, you know, again, it's really, really re frustrating because it's counterintuitive and the stakes are extremely high. You know, a lot of times people spend their life savings, you know, leveraging their relationships and, and, you know, spending all their money on getting a bar just to open. And, and it's just, you know, this is a contribute, like this contributes to the massive, massive failure rate in the first five years. I mean, yeah. what do you, like, what, like, what, what do you, th like, what do you guys teach in, in your like systems and operations components? So it's great. I mean, everything you said, I, I love because I, you know, again, one of the things that I try to do day one, especially in my management classes is open people's eyes to the reality of not just specifically owning a restaurant, but running a small business, because it's a completely different skill set and you need really very different interests. Now, there's not to say that people don't have multiple sets, you know, just because I like bartending doesn't mean I don't like being a manager, but, you know, you have to like both. So one of the things that I try and do is, is open people's eyes up to the realities of, as you mentioned, the time commitment. I mean, I had a client and I use this example in class all the time. I had a client, client that about, I don't know, was somewhere within the first year of working 80 hour weeks, you know, literally every single week from, nine months before open until like dot, 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 you know, came to me and was like, I thought, you know, at some point being a business owner meant, you know, I was going to be able to like manage the business from the beach. You know, when do I get to go to the beach? And I was like, <laughs> you got to tell me, cause I haven't met anybody, yeah, you know, that, the beach. Yeah, there's no beach, there's right? No beach. You, I mean, <laughs> you, you have to love the 80 hours. That's what, that has to be your beach, right? You got to love the 80 hours. Now there's a, there's a self-care portion of it. You know, 80 hours is not healthy, sustainable. At some point you need to be able to dial that back. And that's about raising a bunch of people up. Like we just talked about mm -hmm. so that you can, go to the beach, but you can't run your business unless you're, you know, wealthier than I think most people can dream of or understand. You got to be there, right? But then the, the other thing is the financial aspect of running restaurants or small businesses that people don't understand. You know, that, mm -hmm. you know, I just had this conversation last night with a group of students. Uh, we, we, have, we were doing financials and, um, you know, I said, I'm constantly amazed at how much money the average person on the street thinks a restaurant owner makes. And, you know, anecdotally, my experience is that if you ask a person on the street, how much money the owner of a restaurant that does a million dollars in sales makes, they're going to come in at somewhere about a half million dollars. And the reality of it, you know, as you and I both know, is if you are the best of the best, it's 10% and most restaurants are running five, six, seven, right? If you're, if you're even making money, and that's not really leaving anything on the table to expand. Not at all. Zero. Right. And so, so the realities of the time, you know, and I always say if that's making a million dollars in sales. You're lucky. You are lucky, lucky, lucky to put somewhere around 80,000. There's easier ways of doing that. You can get a, a job at any tech firm and make more than that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and have a foosball table, <laughs> you know, in your yeah. house. So, so the realities of, of the time commitment, the, the financial aspect of it. And this is why, you know, sort of my whole thing is I spend that first day or two with students trying to determine, is this something that you love and that you're passionate about? And that when you wake up in the morning, you're going to say, I want to do this all day. 
And that's not everyone. And that's not somebody certainly who just was making drinks for eight or nine hours a shift. Maybe that person, but you got to really ask yourself, am I passionate about this? You know, we have a saying at the school that says passion cures everything. And I believe that. I think if you're passionate about something, you're going to do it well. You're not going to need to be managed. You're going to need to be mentored. And that's what I look for in employees, mm-hmm. right? But I think it's a matter of, of we need to do a better job helping people understand what they love and what it's okay to love doing. You know, when I know when I first started, and I think I'm older than you, but, you know, bartending was a thing you got into because you didn't have anything else. And, you know, you didn't want to go home and tell your parents, you know, I'm a, I'm a bartender full time. There were plenty of people doing it, but it was something you know, I'm, I'm an aspiring actor. I'm an aspiring novelist. Somewhere around 2000, I think it became something that you could say, I am a, and we, you know, came up with the word mixologist, but whatever you want to call it, this is what I do. You know, I'm going to go to ICE. I'm going to get a a, a certificate and I'm going to work as this. I'm going to, you know, have a, a bog or whatever. And it became something that it was okay to love doing. And manual labor in this country, I think, has been so devalued post World War II that people have trouble saying, I am someone who, who loves going to work and doing something with my hands for eight hours a day. And I live comfortably and I contribute to that. And that's what I want to do. And I, you know, I don't need to be an owner. I don't need to work in a cube. I don't need a title. Some people it's, I don't need a college degree of any particular, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But we, we kind of devalue that. And when you have a bunch of people that aren't really sure what they love to do, or what is acceptable socially to be passionate about, I think you end up with with a lot of problems that you talked about, you know, and, you know, not everyone needs to be a restaurant owner to be successful in the restaurant business there. And there are plenty of other things you can do that are outside of even the scope of the four walls of a restaurant that contribute massively to the food service industry. Right. There are, there are so many different hustles out there. Oh, my God. And and like you're a great example of, of how to expand on what you already know and what you do uh, with your background in theater and having owned a bar and being a professional educator, you know, and that and then a Bible happened. And, right. and that and that's a kind of amazing. I'm still kind of blown away by that because I, I haven't actually seen the show, but um, I did see something that I was just like I saw Bernie Lubbers act. Have you seen that? No, where like, he, he goes through basically the history of bourbon and song. Oh, and wow. I, le- I learned more about bourbon in one hour of watching his show than I ever did, you know, sitting through uh, dry seminars. But yeah, there's a, a bazillion little hustles out there. And that's kind of what I really want to get across. And, and it's uh, it's kind of a poignant issue right now because people are reluctant to go into crowded places right now because of the coronavirus. And, you know, I think we everybody has their own opinions on this um, about, you know, whether it's overblown or not. Uh, or whether it's it's just like kind of flu plus, but uh, the the fact remains that people are reluctant to go into bars, and you know this is only going to get worse. And so, if you're not really diversifying your skills, if you're not second scaling, if you're not learning about different elements of different businesses, then you are going to. If you only do one thing, then that one thing, uh, like right now, for instance, could go away, and yeah. uh, and your your ability to monetize that skill is going to go away. So I would just you know I think the idea of going to certificate or not. You know, although I think it's uh, getting a certificate from ICE is probably a little bit more prestigious than just going to say, I watched a bunch of YouTube videos. If you're not engaging in these available, you know, educational opportunities, then you're just going to get left behind. And I think in Bible is just kind of a a fun way to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always like, to, I mean, you, you're summarizing so many things that I believe so strongly. And, you know, I always, well, people ask me, how did the Bible happen? And I said, you know, it, to me, it's a dream, but it's literally, I took the two things I was most passionate about and figured out a way to put them together. And people were like, how did you come up with that? And I was like, I was actually surprised no one has done that before because drinks and theater go hand in hand from day one from both of them. Right. And, but I always, I always tell folks that, to me, the most interesting things happen at points of intersection, right? There's a great book, uh, an ecological book, the title escapes me, but it's about the tidal zone where like life started at the intersection of land and water, you know, because the energy is there and because it's a mixture of two different environments and there's all kinds of, and I think that that analogy is true in so many places. If you can take two interests and combine them, I think your your one, your passion in both goes through the roof. You bring more to the table. You know, I believe that people who do a lot of different things do them all better uh, because they're bringing Mm -hmm. different skill sets to the table. 
And, and it's more unique to you because a lot of people probably do both of the things that you're passionate about, but much less people do. A lot of people do each of the things you're passionate about. Most, much less people do both. Right. And, and, and you don't have to be a master of, of, of all these things. You can no. be a master of making cocktails if you want. And that's, that's obviously very helpful, but you know, you have to like in the context of opening up a bar, you have to have an understanding of marketing. You have to have an understanding of HR. You have to have an understanding of compliance. You have to have an understanding of how to talk to people and, you know, how to, you know, cultivate a, a great team and blah, 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 blah. But yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, I'm sorry. I, I totally. No, I mean, I think, off. and you, I mean, you hit it. I think you, you don't have to be a master. It goes back to what I was saying before. I do think you need to be passionate about it. You need to love it. One of the things that consistently blows my mind, if you had told me when I was like nine years old, you know, with my grandmother watching, you know, Julia Child on PBS, that there would be such a thing as a celebrity chef, you know, I would, we would have laughed you out of the room because it was literally Julia Child and that was it, maybe Galloping Gourmet. Now, most of yeah, I was, I was again, a large Cook, majority of students. Yeah, galloping away, right? Um, a lot of students come to ICE not to be chefs. They come to be TV stars. And we have to like tell them, this isn't really <laughs> how this works, right? Um, right. But, but what I found is that, you know, I wouldn't have believed that that was possible. What I have learned is that if you're passionate about something, enough about something, people will pay to watch you do it. And they'll pay to watch you learn to do it. Mm -hmm. When, you know, when you look at what, you know, what's, what we look at, even on YouTube, you know, it's, it's watching other people play video games for goodness sakes is a thing that, that blows my mind, right? Because they're passionate, they're good at it and they're learning and you can learn by proxy through them. So I, I couldn't agree with your point more. You don't need to say, you don't need to say, I need to master this. What you need to say is I would like to someday be a master of this and I'm going to let you share that journey in some way. And, and that in itself to me is more. Yeah. No, uh, I mean, I was not born a master podcaster. I'm just going to share that with you. <laughs> but you have arrived. <laughs> not yet. It's the journey that matters, not the destination. Yeah. Yeah. I just see, uh, I mean, as far as like in Bible, I see you guys can do that anywhere, right? Yeah. So actually the, the, the thing that we're working on now is uh, we're looking to take it on the road. Um, you know, it started as a brand activation. We have a lot of brands uh, use the show for training. We've had Angels Envy come in. We've had United States Bartenders Guild, NYC come in. Um, Bacardi took us to Tales of the Cocktail in 2015, I think. And so we'd like to see more brands use the show for training and distributors and things. It's a, an organic pl product placement for a lot of brands. Um, mm -hmm. But what we're doing next is we want to take the Bible on the road because that's the number one request that we get. And because it came out of a fringe theater festival, it's a very lightweight show. We call it in Bible in a box. So we can put it in a van and we can take it anywhere. So we recently went to the Association of Performing Arts Presenters Conference in New York City. In January, we got some really great feedback um, and we're putting together. It looks like we may have two different tours coming up, end of 2020, beginning of 2021. We'll be able to take the Imbibal out on the road. And I think that's going to be really, really impactful for sort of bringing this. You know, our whole thing is appreciating cocktails and spirits um, for their cultural and scientific contributions, not as an intoxicant, which is sort of, you know, how America post-1933 tends, and that's the story that we tell, not to, you know, spoiler alert, but that's sort of the story that we tell is that the mindset of America is very much these things are intoxicants, they're drugs, they're, you know, artificial signs of adulthood. A lot of things, you know, go see the show. But at the end of the day, what we can, what we try and say is the cultural contribution, the scientific contribution, the social contribution, this is a cuisine like any other cuisine. And I think getting that message out across the rest of the country is something, you know, we talk about passion. That's probably the thing I'm most passionate about, because if I can get people to view the products that you and I are love so much as positive contributions to their day, that would be an amazing, I know that's a lofty goal, but that would be, that would be a life's work for me. That's incredible. What is the actual runtime of the show? How long is it? Take? It's a it's a, a full two hours. All of our shows are two hours. They're the majority of our audience are New York theater goers. You know, we we play off Broadway. We are we're sold through Telecharge, as close to a traditional New York theater experience as we could possibly make it, but with all of the things that you would find very familiar, having gone to and lectured at all the cocktail conferences, and you know, I I, I just. It's really important to me that, you know, one of, one of the best things that I get feedback wise from people is one, I'm surprised at how 
much I learned because they don't always expect that. But more, more impactful is when they tell me I'm surprised at how much I retained the next day because we try and hit people, you know, because I have the sort of the learning theory background, you know, we, we tell you something. So it's auditory. We have a whole slideshow presentation. So it's visual. And then we give you the drink. So it's tactile. So we hit you three times in each of the three standard learning modes. And the goal is that whether you kind of realize it or not, you're actually going to learn something and you're actually going to retain it. And I think that's part of the reason why the shows have been successful because people come back four or five times, they take notes, they bring people, you know, to share that experience. And, 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 you know, we get parents all the time that say, I'm coming back with my 21 year old, because I, I think this may give them a fighting chance to not do beer bongs in college. And, you know, my heart soars when I hear that kind of thing. Right. So that's really what the shows are about. It's about appreciating the culture and the history and the science. Cause I'm a geek, you know, behind this, this, and I, I just want to take that to as, as wide an audience as possible. And I think it's in the best interest of the industry. I think it's the best way to avoid prohibition too. And I think it's good for the brands. Wow. Thank you so much for, for sharing all that with us. <laughs> Anthony Caporelli from In Bible and Ice. Jason, thank you so much. I just have to say, man, you are absolutely one of the top people I look up to in this industry and have for a long, long time. Oh, um, stop it. So, no, I'm serious, man. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me and thanks for everything that you do for this industry. You're a real uh, thought leader here. I hope you've enjoyed this episode talking with Anthony Caporelli. What I really took away from this was that he used his skill as a bartender to create a new facet in the spirits and hospitality industry by producing content. I think that's especially relevant in the age of the coronavirus. Be sure to check out the show notes for a brief summary. Special thanks to Danny Messina for editing and post-producing the show. I'd like to keep these shows super short and dense. If you have any thoughts, questions, or ideas, please be sure to reach out to Jason Luttrell on Twitter and Instagram or search for Jason Luttrell on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you got anything out of our time together, you can thank me by simply sharing this with another person. If you love the show, please hit the subscribe button, leave a rating and review, or comment on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again, and I hope to see you soon.